we're now going to talk about wiring. When a referee is called out to judge for a wire, the referee calls a timeout and then asks these three questions in this order. What ball's turn is it? The reason for this is that you can't rule on a wire unless it's that ball's turn. This ball is sometimes known as the asking ball. The second question is, what side is responsible for the asking ball's position? The opponents have to be responsible for the asking ball's position. Finally, what is the deadness? The asking ball must have a shot on at least one ball it's alive on. That is, an object such as a wicket, peg, or dead ball can't block the path toward any part of the live ball it can hit. Also, the normal backswing of the striker can't be interfered with by these objects. And one other, the wicket, peg, or a dead ball can't prevent a normal swing. In other words, the entire striking face must be able to address the ball without coming in contact with these objects first. Before we look at on-court wiring situations, let's see an animation. In diagram 1, red feels it's wired on blue. After all three prerequisites have been met, the referee can begin the process to test. If referees can judge without the aid of test balls, they will do so. If, however, the referee feels a test ball or test balls are needed, they will use them. There are two types of wiring tests, a one-ball test and a two-ball test. Let's look at the one-ball test first. Diagram 2 shows yellow placed against the upright of the wire in question, in this case the fifth wicket. How yellow is placed is critical to give an accurate ruling. Yellow represents where red would be if it barely touched the wicket on its way to the blue ball. Diagram 3 shows an overhead view of the test ball. Diagram 4 shows the critical aspects. The vertical and horizontal lines form a T. The top of the T shows the precise point that red would just touch the upright on its way to hit the edge of blue it may be wired from. The bottom of the T goes through the center of the test ball, which is the area that red will travel through as it goes toward blue. That bottom of the T must be perpendicular to the line the top T represents. This is such an important part of placing this test ball. Ideally, you want to place the test ball touching the upright. We'll explain why in a moment. You may find it's hard to keep the test ball touching, and we'll address how to rule if there is a tiny space between the ball and the upright. Diagram 5 shows a white line going from the edge of the asking ball red straight toward the test ball yellow, aligned with its right edge, and finally extending into the left portion of the blue ball. This indicates a wire. Red is being denied a chance to hit the left edge of blue due to the wicket being in the way. Again, yellow represents where red would be, as it just barely skims the upright on its way to blue. In diagram 6, we have moved blue a tiny bit to the right to see how this would affect a ruling. The white line is in the same position as it previously was with regard to red and yellow, but it now touches the left edge of blue. This is still a wire because red is still barely contacting the edge of the upright as it goes toward blue. This drives home the point of how important yellow's correct position is and whether it's in contact with the upright or not. For it not to be wired, red has to miss the upright. If you weren't able to get the test ball to touch and there was a tiny space between yellow and the upright, diagram 6 would then be ruled no wire. You can now see how important it is to get the test ball placed properly. In diagram 7, we move blue even a little more to the right to show what it would look like to have no wire. You can see the white line now is clearly to the left of blue. Image 8 shows a real-life example. The referee has been called and the three prerequisites met to rule on a wire. 
In this example, it's not easy to determine if this is a wire, so a test ball will be used. Image 9 shows a test ball properly placed. When you're being tested to become a referee, it's critical that you place this test ball correctly. Image 10 shows that this is a wire. Red is not able to hit the left edge of blue. There are times it's not so easy to rule and you have to use your best judgment. Something I do these days is use a mirror to help make a judgment. Diagram 11 shows the basic setup. A mirror angled at about 45 degrees, either freestanding on its own base, or like this example, leaning up against a ball carrier. The ball carrier on the right is used as a background to contrast the ball colors. In image 12, we see what a referee would see when getting the correct view. The idea is to get the right edges of red and yellow lined up and see if the line infringes on blue. In this case, it does and confirms the wire. Diagram 13 shows how this system works when there is space between red and yellow's line as it pertains to blue. Here, this confirms no wire. Assuming you have the test ball in contact with the upright, if red and yellow's line was in line with the edge of blue, this would be a wire. If you had the tiniest space between the test ball and the upright, and red and yellow's line went to the edge of blue, then it would be ruled no wire. As said before, it's best to get the test ball touching the upright. We're now going to take a look at the two ball test. This should be used only when it's not effective to use the preferred one ball test. The one ball test is preferred because it doesn't require a test ball to be placed near the ball in question, a ball that could be accidentally moved by the test ball and thereby compromise the test. As we did with the one ball test, we're going to look at a short animation before looking at an on-court example. In diagram 14, red claims it's wired on blue. A referee is called a timeout, confirms the three prerequisites, and then takes a look without any test balls. It's close enough to use test balls. First one, and if that one ball test doesn't work, a second. In diagram 15, we have removed the first test ball to show you the details of the second test ball. Black represents the spot red needs to be in to just touch the left edge of blue. Diagram 16 shows a white line showing the direct path red must take. Diagram 17 shows both test balls along with some white lines. The white line that runs from red to test ball yellow shows the direction that red must take if it just skimmed the upright in question and the line from yellow to test ball black shifts to the left. In this example, that shift to the left shows that red is wired on blue. In diagram 18, we see a straight line going from red through the center of yellow and then through the center of black. Assuming yellow is in contact with the upright, this too would be a wire. If, however, there was a tiny space between yellow and the upright, then this would not be a wire. As said before, we suggest getting that test ball against the upright if possible. In diagram 19, the white line from yellow to black shifts to the right, and this indicates no wire. Diagram 20 shows an on-court example with red claiming it's wired on blue. Here you can see that blue is a long distance from red. This may be an example of where a two ball test is required. Diagram 21 shows the same view with one test ball placed. Assuming a referee can't rule with just one test ball, a second test ball will be used. To begin the process, in diagram 22, the referee has carefully marked blue, the ball in question, with four ball markers. You want to be careful when placing these markers so as to not compromise Blue's position, which is the sole reason the markers are being used in the first place. The following procedure I'm about to show you may seem over the top with regard to detail. 
Not all referees do this, nor may they agree it's a good idea or even an effective approach. Whether you embrace what I'm about to show you or not, in the end, you will need to find the safest and most accurate way to place this test ball to make an accurate call. Diagram 23 shows a mallet placed on the ground in a way you might see a beginning level player use a mallet to line up a takeoff shot. Getting the shaft lined up in the correct direction, along with not having the mallet head touching blue, is important. You want it very close, but not touching. Diagram 24 shows an inverted view with a mallet on the bottom being the one we just talked about, the one that's directed toward red, while the mallet on the right is very carefully placed so that the blue ball cannot be moved laterally. You want a tiny distance between this mallet head and blue, but not touching blue. Diagram 25 shows yet another mallet used to very slowly and very carefully guide the test ball in place. Where some referees may try to get black to touch blue, I try to put an extremely tiny paper width space between the test ball and the ball in question. I do not want to compromise blue's position. If you're confident you can get it to touch, go for it but be very, very careful. Diagram 26 shows the final positions with a very slight space between blue and the bottom of the mallet head and the same for black. In diagram 27, the mallet pointing toward the asking ball red is carefully removed. In diagram 28, the referee stands, squats, or lays down in a position to make a ruling from the perspective of the asking ball. On a video screen, it is hard to tell, but since I was the one who created the scenario on the court, it was ruled just barely a wire. Looking at diagram 29, the line from yellow to black goes the slightest amount to the left, which indicates a wire. Knowing I placed the test ball not touching blue, if the referee viewed this as a straight line, it would not be a wire. In diagram 30, I move blue slightly to the viewer's right, and this would be no wire.